Radio check. Loud and clear. KSL Sports and KSL Podcast present Mode Push, an American view of F1, starting now. Don't stop. This is what you get. What is... Honestly. I've guessed it. I've absolutely guessed it. I enjoy this so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, welcome on in. It is another edition of Mode Push, an American view of F1. Alex Curie, Dan Jimenez, another episode. Thanks for being with us on the program. A little tardy on the uh, uptake on this one. Uh, we added a new member of the family this week. And so uh, not to, you know, I don't like jumping too far into that stuff, Dan. But, you know, it was just one of those things I couldn't avoid for at least a couple of days. I had to uh, put it off and hang out with the family at home for a minute. The, the greatest of reasons to uh, <laughs> delay an episode of the podcast. Congrats. That's well, thanks, that's man. awesome news. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, the real winner is uh, my kids who get to hold a new baby. They're very excited about it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got tons to jump into. My heavens, I don't even know where to start because in the end, Sunday's race. Let's go there first. Let's go to Miami and just a little bit of a review of what that of what that GP ended up being. And uh, I I don't know. I, I had mixed feelings on it because I just I told you before the whole thing started out. I wanted Checo to pocket another race because we know how difficult it's going to be to run Max down in some of these European races. And so not being able to do it was. I mean, the whole field has been gut punched the entire season by Max's performance and by Red Bull's performance, and uh, certainly. But uh, even Checo can't get his guy, can't get his teammate. Was there a little bit of luck in there, or I mean, strategy wise on the tire, was was Checo kind of screwed over by the team, or or was it just kind of the luck of what what ended up kind of being the track progression for the day? Oh man, yeah, it, it was a gut punch for Checo. I. I think you have a really good point that he needs to get all the wins that he can and starting on pole with max and ninth, you had to think he was like, all right, this one, if I don't screw anything up, like this one's in the bag because, you know, he started on mediums along with all the other, uh, uh, pretty much everybody in the top 10, except max. So he started on the mediums, which was the, um, what everyone had predicted was going to be the better strategy, start on the medium and then go to the hards. And, um, they just uh, kind of Red Bull split the strategy and put Max on the hards and uh, want to have him finish on the mediums. And then like, you know, they were predicting after the first pit stop that they would kind of come to the, you know, to the end of the race, three laps to go, that they'd be in about the same spot and then they could fight it out. I think what happened was the hard tires lasted a lot longer and did not um, degradate uh, and lose time like everyone had predicted. Right. And Max in that, lap 30 to lap 40 range just crushed it like when he was supposed to be losing time to Checo on his new mediums he was not he was like running faster laps than Checo on new mediums which I don't think anybody including Max would have expected to happen but that's how it played out and um or I guess Checo was on was on new hards when when Max was on old hards and Max was running faster times than Checo on new hards, which is I think was the surprising part where like Checo came out, had that gap, had got it down to like 15 um, seconds uh, behind Max. So he was going to have like a five second, uh, you know, um, gap on him after Max pit. And then Max just started laying down faster times and faster times, got it up to like 18 seconds, 19 seconds. And so when he uh, came out, he was only a second or two behind Checo and it was over at that point. I think that one of the things that happened on Sunday, and this has been happening basically throughout the entirety of the season, I feel like now is that we're like, okay, whatever's going on on the front, fine. We kind of got we kind of got a little bit spoiled, I think, in uh, in the previous race because those two were fighting at the front, kind of of the race, and and it, and it was you know Max unable to run down Checo. This one was just this you know I don't know. There's this awful scene in uh, in Saving Private Ryan. You remember this when uh, 
that one guy just slowly stabbing the other guy, right? Just like <laughs> this, like slow death, and telling him to be quiet. Shh, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, that is terrifying. That's what I felt like that uh, Max was doing in this race on Sunday. We're just like, oh my gosh, we know what's going to happen here. When there, when the <laughs> when the times weren't turning over, when it ended up being like an e- like he's reeling him in on. On these old tires, <laughs> and and yeah. it, the, the changeover, and you're kind of going, what what is going on here? So in my mind, I was like, is Checo just not turning over really good laps here? Like, is 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 really the fact that Checo? I mean, Checo doesn't. It's not like he's new to this. That's why I was wondering. Like, it, it, was it his tire dag on top of all that? Was it really just that Max knows how to uh, flip a lap better than everybody else on the grid? On top of the fact that he has the best car. Uh, I I think that Max is not getting enough credit right now for the just absolute sheer skill and speed that he has. Um, I think a lot of people like to say, oh, well, the Red Bull car is just like, you know, way faster than the rest of the field, which it is. But man, like Max does some pretty unprecedented um, things in that in, in that car. And uh, I mean, he surprised everybody, including his own team, with how fast he was on those old tires. So I think you have to hand it to Max. He got the win, I think totally fair and square and like you said as soon as the time started not going in Checo's favor when they should have been in that lap 30 to 40 segment it was like that you knew what was going to happen you just knew that as soon as Max got on those fresh tires he's just going to whip right past and and Checo couldn't do anything about it so there's there are people out there saying like oh well like Red Red Bull screwed Checo they put him on the wrong strategy I think that's like Monday morning Monday morning quarterbacking this thing when I like it was the obvious choice that he should on pole start on mediums. Um, and I, there's other people saying that, uh, man, that like they were really quiet on the radio. Like Sergio had to ask what Max's times <laughs> were, where they trying to hide what Max Max's times were just so that like, I like, that's obviously no, obvious. that's not the case. Sergio has a lot of that information in the car with him as he's going. So uh, I don't think that there's anything nefarious going on here. I just Max, just got an incredible pace out of really old tires and had a one second or a two second gap to Checo when he came out instead of like an eight second gap. Uh, okay. The rest of the race, everybody else that was out there, were there any surprises on the finish? Because I think that, uh, I think Fernando Alonso, just like the loneliest man on the racetrack was, was Fernando, right? I mean, the guy, he had 30 yeah. seconds uh, in front of him was Sergio Perez. 35-plus seconds behind him was was George Russell, which, of course, gave us one of the more interesting radio calls of the day where he was like, good move by uh, Lance at, the, what was that, turn 11? <laughs> like, he's, you're going, dude, why are you watching the video screen while you're going 200 miles an hour down the track? But uh, uh, he just kind of... I think that kind of shows right now where Aston Martin's car is, although it must be massively embarrassing for uh, Lance Stroll, who I think ended up, what did Stroll end up in 12th? I don't know. I don't don't know what the, I don't know what the exact reason was for that. I thought that the mega drive of the day sort of went to Kevin Magnuson, who scored a point, but really just battled (laughs) Charles Leclerc all day long. Like why on earth is Kevin Magnuson and Charles Leclerc like fighting it out uh, for a good chunk of that race. I loved it, and they scored a point for Haas. And so uh, on a day that uh, Haas probably thought, well, we'd be lucky if we were even sniffing there close. Uh, qualifying gave them an opportunity because I think he started, I think, fourth on the grid that day. But uh, for mm-hmm. me, guys who stood out, who had who perform- outperformed what they probably should have been doing, both Alpines, I think, had a pretty decent day. And then uh, K-Mag uh, was uh, impressive because the guy just has, like, a, 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 lot of, a lot of driving talent. And he needed that because he'd been kind of struggling. Yeah. I, I, it was good to see Haas competitive on uh, U.S. soil. That brought a little bit of uh, American pride that Logan Sargent wasn't able to provide this weekend. But... I, uh, yeah, I think we talk a lot about like, wow, the Aston Martin um, customer team is beating the factory Mercedes team. But like, yeah, you saw the the customer Haas Ferrari team racing side by side with Charles. And, you know, that's not what Ferrari wants to see either. So, I mean, good on, good on K-Mag. That, that was great. Um, yeah, I, man, I tend to always think like glass half empty and look at like, man, McLaren, just what a terrible weekend. Oh my weekend. gosh, yeah just absolute garbage it's and it's so sad because after ba- uh, baku there was a bit of hope right uh, they've been improving that, that for some a of these races. changes were 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 good and meaningful but 
man, they just took like another step backwards. I, I, I might say they are the slowest car on the grid right now. Well, I was bummed out for Logan Sargent because he's like, you know, from 10 miles from where the race happened. And, uh, you know, though, you know, those guys, it's always funny when they're like, oh, that's their home track. It's like, uh, Oscar Piastri, when they went back to, uh, to Australia and they're like, it's your home track. You grew up in the shadow of this place. He's like, yeah, I have never raced there. And I've been living in Europe for the past 20 years. So, you know, how it is. uh, it's my quote home track, but, uh, Yuki Tsunoda pocketing another 11th place for the guy, the poor kid. He just keeps coming in 11th every other race. It seems like. I was confused as to what happened with Mercedes this weekend. I wasn't sure whether or not I should be impressed or still like not that uh, not that impressed by what Lewis Hamilton and George Russell did. What did Ferrari do this weekend with their fourth and sixth place uh, finishes with George and Lewis respectively? Was that something where I know Toto goes, "This is not what we wanted," but you know it's okay for the car that we have. And you're going, "I don't, I don't know if I should be impressed by the the fourth and sixth performance or not." Yeah, they had an up and down weekend. They were the fastest. They were one two in P- in first practice in FP one, and then they like immediately fell down the timetables in the second and third practice. So yeah, I felt like George had a pretty good race. Um, I mean, he's thirty three seconds off the Red Bulls, but he was twelve seconds off Fernando. So I um or no, it was a uh, uh, seven seconds off of right. off Fernando. Yep. Anyways, I think George. Uh, was impressive, and I think he's showing that he's faster in this car than Lewis. He has a better handle on on this car, and um, the big thing for Mercedes is Imola. That's what they keep talking about. Hey, all the changes are coming to Imola. I saw a report today that's like half the car is going to be different in Imola than than what it's been all what season. What do the upgrades so, really do? Like, what's the reality of an upgrade when they go, oh, but we have tons of upgrades coming, so watch out for us. I'm like, well, then why don't you put them on now? <laughs> Yeah, uh, they are uh, new suspension design components, new front nose, new side pod, new floor. Like it's just all these pieces that actually take time to manufacture and then have all the spares and everything that you need to be able to take to a race. So, um, yeah, that's it's a, lo- a laundry list of of components that are going onto the car, but they're mostly ex- you know, suspension and then like exteriors, you know, so we'll be able to see like it should be pretty indicative when they start putting that car together in Imola, um, what they're what they're trying to do. And there's a lot of people saying it's going to come out looking exactly like essentially the Aston Martin and the Red Bull. So uh, we'll see. Uh, But I'm I'm, I think that's what Toto has been pointing everybody towards is like, you know, Imola is when we're going to, you know, start to re like push the reset button on the development of this car and i think he was even hedging and saying that like we might take a, a couple steps back uh in imola from maybe where we've been on pace but like that's so that we can make uh more progress going forward in the right direction but uh ferrari wise uh man carlos seems to like always finish in fifth place no matter what <laughs> and then tr- and then charles like oh like the qualifying thing just really uh, showed that he is still well, so weird. he's not one one with the car and he he needs to stop wrecking cars i think ferrari is well one i'd obviously agree with you about the stop wrecking our cars part but how many times do we have to hear a radio call of him sorry guys sorry guys Jeez. <laughs> like he's so disappointed in himself and you go dude you put that in the like he was already getting loose right I mean, it happened. He had to bail, I think, on the on the fast lap, I think, before. And then as soon as he gets into that one, he starts really kind of gunning for it. And everybody's going, uh, he's looking a little loose here. He's not even setting any insane, like, sector times in that first part. And then he just sends it into the wall. And on the day of, I, doesn't, I don't care how good of a racer you are. At some point, your car is... Your car is the third or fourth, at best, fastest car on this grid right now. And so... This is that, that it's really ridiculous that the most consistent guy on that Ferrari team is Carlos Sainz. Like you're supposed yeah. to be, he's supposed to be the Max Verstappen of that team, and everybody's waiting for him to be that Max Verstappen of the entire grid, and he just can't get there. He can't even do that on his own team. Uh, constructor standings. So Red Bulls won all five races that they've had this year so far. So it's been a one two one two, and then I think a one five, and then the one two again. So they've had <laughs> not really a lot of competition. Uh, throughout this thing but in the midfields 
Uh, speaking of people who are going to be falling, I think McLaren's going to fall off even more. Alpine at least got double points this time around when they probably should have gotten some, obviously, uh, in in previous races. Obviously, Australia sticks out, and then they had a garbage race at Baku. But you're looking at Alpine probably jumping McLaren, and they're, they're going to be right there behind Ferrari, except for, can I roll out some news that I read? It's always mm. good when it's from an Italian media source because oh, yes. they are so <laughs> pissy. Like, they are so mad. And uh, so when you have to, like, hit the translate button, it always feels good. Uh, Otmar Snaffauer is apparently under pressure because Alpine uh, has – Apparently contacted Mattia Binotto to be a part of it, or at least kind of get kind of test the waters just to see what his <laughs> thoughts have been. Anytime I hear anything about that kind of stuff, mid season, of course, too, it's such a weird deal. I could see, I could see Alpine because they've pulled the trigger on uh, things so quickly before that they could pull the trigger on on firing Snaff Hour and then pulling in uh, Mattia Binotto mid season or maybe in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. There was the news from the weekend that Renault's CEO had called out the Alpine team saying that like they were, you know, an embarrassment and oh, they boy. were <laughs> severely underperforming. Jeez. So then everyone's like, oh, man, is Otmar's job on the line? And then, yeah, now this rumor that they're talking to, of all people, but note, though, I man, I feel like that would be the bad move. I think Otmar is a great um, team boss and. Uh, I think they'll get it together. I actually think that they have the speed. They just haven't had like maybe the reliability or the fortune where McLaren has, doesn't have the speed, but they've lucked into some points finishes and they're, they both have 14 points. They're tied for fifth and sixth Mm -hmm. in the constructor standing. So uh, yeah, we will see. I, I hope they keep Otmar in there. I think he's, he's, he's hard to be on the, uh, on the grid. I think. It's really weird too, because I think about it and their, their CEO, was saying, hey, you know, this team should be in fourth place. And I'm going, how? I mean, it's one thing to go, you should you should leapfrog McLaren. It's like, yeah, absolutely, you should be. But getting fourth in the standings is a big ask, even considering that uh, you're talking about Ferrari and Mercedes who are likely going to be fighting for that fourth place spot. You know, I mean, if Mercedes can't run down Aston Martin, I mean, you're talking about three teams that are legitimately, like, the points are ridiculous already from Red Bull. Like, throw out the throw out Red Bull, who's got 122 points more than anybody else, okay? Throw that out. Aston Martin has 102 points. Mercedes has 96, and Ferrari has 98 or 78. That's a really close freaking race for that second to fourth spot. Fifth and – I've heard people go, yeah, that two to six, two to seven is, like, really close. I go, no, it's not. Two to four is. After, after that, McLaren and Alpine can't get out of each other's way – but nobody is going – they're not going to run down Ferrari. Like, let's – I don't think they need to – I think it's unreasonable to say that they should be fourth place on the grid. When you have Red Bull, Aston Martin, Mercedes, and Ferrari that all have better cars than anybody else, basically five through ten. And the unfortunate thing is Williams has got a – has got, uh, a, I think, a really weird car because I can't figure it out. I don't know why they keep uh, kind of struggling. Alex Albon, I keep waiting for him to have a weekend where he's like a P7 or something. It just never happens. And then Logan Sargent is a rookie who needs to kind of get a couple of years under his belt. I'm really a believer in, because I've already seen the stupidity also, Dan, of people reporting that, oh, you've got to watch out because uh, Nick DeVries might lose his gig already. I'm going, why would we do this so quickly? I know that this is the Piranha Club in F1, but you've got to give a couple, maybe – you have to take the the Yuki Sonoda approach to to a, a rookie on a team. You've got to give him a few years. Yeah, the Devree rumors. I uh, it makes you I insane was, because right. of how he was even picked up in the first place, right? Like that is so dumb yeah. how how that whole thing went down. Yeah, and then now the rumor today is um, well, it's not a rumor. It was confirmed that uh, Daniel Ricardo went to Alpha Tauri this week to get his seat fitted, oh but that was gosh. already planned. Like it was already played because he's the he's the reserve driver, right. so they need to have a seat for him in case like somebody gets sick or whatever, and they like got to throw a driver in. So that was already planned, but then it happened to happen on the week that like also Devries, you know, is, is being rumored to to be in the hot seat. So now they're like, oh well, they'll they'll put Daniel in that seat. But like, I mean, if you're Daniel, like that's not a long term solution. You're not going to come back to the sport to drive for Alpha Tower. You might do it as a temporary thing, but I think that if you're Alpha Tower, you're still looking for future talent. So. Even if you bag DeVry, you're still going to pick up another rookie to try to develop before the end of the season. So I 
I, I'm sure that the seat is getting hot for him, uh, no doubt, but I don't think that it's what's being rumored that it's like, well, if he doesn't string together three really good finishes over the, the next uh, three weeks uh, uh, stretch of races, then he's out. F1's doing this thing where they're trying to increase the amount of races, obviously, every year. What's like a good number? You know, I was thinking about, and what's a good number of of, uh, of teams on track, too? Because I remember, I think I remember the days of when there were 22 or 24, you know, uh, cars on the track when I was growing up, just kind of periodically you'd see, you know, teams there. But they're obviously adding a lot more races. Is there a lot of room for more teams? Because I know that obviously when you start to add a couple teams in there, is there like a max of races and of teams that should be racing because at some point you go, wow, there are too many people out there. Yeah, I think the max on the number of teams is 24. And I think they they have that in their, you know, Formula One agreement uh, or 24 cars and 12 teams. Uh, I think what the limitation is, is just like the facilities and what are these uh, these tracks that they're going to? How many people can they actually handle? How many, um, you know, garage areas are there? And you had Christian Horner saying uh, this last weekend that he felt like for some of the tracks they go to, they wouldn't have enough space. I think that's him doing a bit of posturing because I don't think he really wants to dilute the, his share of, of the winnings. Um, he hasn't really had a super positive take anytime they've asked him about expansion. Um, so that's it's probably a, a weak excuse. I'm sure that, uh, F1 could figure it out. But yeah, I like 24 is a great number. It doesn't need to be any bigger than that. Um, and it could... You know, introducing two new teams, if it's Andretti and um, I guess uh, who's the other one that was wanting to come in? Um, I guess. Yeah, I can't remember who, so the, the, who the second uh, one is. I thought, now. I, I've heard rumor of like, uh, you know, BMW and then you you know that the that the Audi thing, obviously. But Andretti, yeah. I, Andretti, that was one. Cadillac was another but they were going to team up, right? I mean, that was the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, it was Andretti teams. Cadillac. Yeah, and then it was, I guess Ford was the other one I was thinking of, but they've instead come in as an engine They're like, sponsor we'll just, we'll for, start, we'll, we'll for sneak in. We'll sneak in making the engines, and then at some point we'll get, uh, we'll think pretty not, uh, fancy of ourselves and put our own team together. I mean, honestly, I why would you not make that move? Uh, like, if they're not doing the research to be an actual team at some point, you know, on the grid in 2028, 20, 2030 or something like that. I know that's like me talking about us getting a baseball team in Salt Lake City in the next, like, 15 mm-hmm. years or whatever. But you have to be thinking about that because that's the way that things are growing. It was the weirdest thing on the planet for me to watch Valtteri Bottas. Uh, and uh, I think it, was, it wasn't it was Joe Guan Yu who threw out the first pitch, but it was he – it was – it was uh, <laughs> it was somebody else from from Alpha who who like showed up, but Valtteri with a baseball glove on throwing a pitch out. Like I was going, this is the weirdest thing ever. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in the stands who are like, who are these freaking guys? And then there are a bunch of people who, who are like, oh my gosh, the mustache, it's Valtteri. Like th- that's how the sport is right now in America, right? Like you're not going to get the full mainstream hookup, but you know, them being at a baseball game is kind of interesting because baseball has uh, you know a marketing problem, and F1 is on the rise, and so. Uh, I look at I look at that and I go, that was the weirdest thing for me. But if you're an American uh, thinking about making yourself a team, you put everything in place to be able to to be in Ford, obviously, GM. Those are the ones that have the money to throw around to be able to be a part of it. And they have to do it if they're going to look like uh, anything that's uh, respectable in the racing world, because everybody in the U.S. is is getting into, into F1, it seems like. Yeah, and I think it was really evident in the pre-race ceremonies at Miami. I mean, they... They le- they really dialed it up. There was just it was very American. I would say like if you've ever watched a uh, you know sat down and done the how many long hours of pre uh, pre game shows for the Super Bowl like that's kind of how the the first hour of the broadcast felt. When normally when we get these other uh, uh, broadcasts, it's just like straight to the racing. This was like the driver introductions and like you know you could tell it was like uh co-sponsored with like the new <laughs> fast and Fur- furious movie and right you know there's people that didn't, a bunch of people didn't like that but there was uh a lot of pop, pop and circumstance behind it but there was i mean every like a lot of a-list celebrities up and down um the 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 paddock there that um is just testament to how uh popular the sport's getting in the u.s i was going to mention though like in that uh in the the pre-race um Martin Brundle uh, walking around in, on Park Ferme and, right. and interviewing trying to all get the, people, kind of running, oh, look, trying to get people. I love that. Oh, look, That's such great television. Will I like, am. Right. 
<laughs> it's like the most chaotic I know. live television because you're just like, this guy is about to either get totally rejected or he's going to piss somebody off or he's actually going to get a good soundbite. Right. One of the good sound bites he got before the uh, the whole um, Jackie Stewart, uh, uh, <laughs> Jackie Stewart thing, which Roger we could Federer. get to, yeah. was he, he found um, – he found uh, Michael Andretti and asked him about the update uh, on them entering the sport. And Michael said that they ha- were submitting all of their paperwork formally to Formula One this week. So hopefully we have news sometime after that uh, about, you know, Michael Andretti making this start in 2026. He said that Michael said that they've already started development on the car as well. So that's already happening. There are teams of engineers hired designing and building f1 chassis um to get ready for 2026 so they're they're supposedly fully invested on this along with cadillac um to to get ready for for them to enter the sport in a few years which was good to hear uh so this is kind of a a fun thing here for us because we're uh, we're we're doing this episode we're kind of breaking down miami uh in a couple of days here we're gonna we're going to uh drop an episode that uh, is really I mean, we were preparing for this kind of knowing, hey, you know, I might be out for a couple of days because of a, a new baby and everything. Uh, but uh, one of the contributors to our show who we've had on before, Carlos Artilas, uh, Carlos Artilas Fortune, who you've had on is he's a Spain native. He's also a uh, massive F1 fan, and he actually worked for NBC Sports doing uh, F1 coverage. Uh, he landed an interview with a guy who he used to work with at NBC Sports, uh, Sean Kelly. And we're going to roll that uh, episode out for you, I think, in the next uh, day or two as well, uh, because Carlos sat down with him, I think, just in the last day, just yesterday, to be able to kind of uh, this. Now, Sean Kelly is a guy who is, they call him the virtual stat man. He's used by 20 of the broadcasts across the world on F1, including Sky F1, including uh, a lot of the American, uh, a lot of the teams as well actually use him because he's just like an insane stat head. He got basically a hobby that turned into a value for these teams who are, uh, you know, using his ability to be able, be able to kind of break down stats and, and and not just from a historical standpoint, but kind of in the in the uh, now. And uh, so Carlos sat down with him, and we'll jump into that interview in the next couple of days here as well. Uh, but what do we have next in terms of a race, uh, Dan? Because I know that next week. Uh, we're kind of jamming or we're going through here until another, I think we have another couple of weeks until we head out to uh, Imola, right? Yeah. So um, we're recording now it's on a Thursday. We got a break this weekend. And then the next weekend we go to Imola and then to Monza. Oh no, Imola, Monaco, and then Spain. So it's the trifecta. They call it of um, three, three weeks of three races in a row all there in Europe. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great to that Imola's where a, uh, a lot of the teams at the beginning of the season had targeted when they'd bring in their first round of major upgrades. Now we saw some come at, at Baku because we had that weird, unexpected um, stretch of time without having the Chinese Grand Prix, but uh, Imola will be a place where we'll see a lot of upgrades and Imola is a track that, you know, we can get more into it next week when we we do the race preview. But Imola is a track that has uh, similar to Baku, where there's a mix of you need some high downforce, but you also need some low drag with it having that really long front stretch and a couple of DRS zones. So um, it should bring people. I think these intermediate tracks where you have to balance the high downforce and the low drag kind of brings everybody back back to the middle a bit and you don't have one you know particular strength stand out above the rest so i look look at it to be i'm looking forward to it to being a competitive race and then obviously monaco it's that's going to be the really exciting one because (laughs) it's so hard to pass at monaco and fernando alonso i think in particular is looking at that race to be his best chance of the year to win uh because if he can qualify well uh and qualify up front uh and he has a you know better chance against the Red Bulls because it is such a slow track that uh, Red Bulls DRS advantage and like low drag advantage won't be you know an advantage there. So if he can get pulled, then he can just park his car in the right spot for you know sixty laps, and re- the Red Bull won't be able to get by him. So uh, I think Monaco is going to be uh, more exciting than perhaps in years past because it gives us the best chance at a surprise winner. Well, we'll be able to see also with the attitude of uh, Max Verstappen, obviously after last year's drama, or at least that they tried to pretend like no, there was no problem there. We're all good in the Red Bull garage. 
Uh, well, we've got tons still to break down. And like I said, in the next couple of days, we're going to drop this uh, episode, an exclusive interview with uh, Sean Kelly of, with our own uh, Carlos Artiles Fortune, who's going to break down the virtual stat man of F1. They lean on him. Crofty leans on this guy to bring him the crazy stats to use for the broadcast. So uh, it'll be awesome to hear from him. Uh, Dan, thanks for hanging out, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Another episode in the books. We'll be back again. Download, subscribe, tell a friend, teach a neighbor about F1. We'll be back again for Dan. I'm Alex. See you next time, everybody.